The thing about technology is, is not to criticize the technology companies, but the te people make a piece of technology and they, they determine, they test some people and they're like, this is the way to use it. And about, for me, about 50% of the time, it's wrong, like for me. So what I do is I get technology and like these kids I have here, I'll use it a bunch before I ever sling it on my tour guys. Then I'll run the tour guys through it and just see what are the commonalities. Like what are all these guys doing that's the same and what's different? And that's a lot of how I learned how to use the technology. And instead of, and I think Mark agreed with me, like the baseline, like when TrackMan came out, everybody's supposed to be up and to the right on their driver. I yeah. mean, it was such a phase. And, you know, some of the best drivers in the world are down to the left, you know. So that's kind of how I use the, the, that aspect of it. I learn from my members. I actually take it to the, to the lesson T for the PGA Tour. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point is that a lot of times that your members and the work you do with them, that's really giving you a good insight as to whether something works or not. And that's the, the key with the technology is, and the information is we're always learning. Like we spend most of our time, at, and we'll talk a little bit about it later, at golf tournaments. Once they're off and the players are doing their thing, we're sitting in caddy dining most of the time or on in the middle of somewhere on a driving range sitting on backpacks and we're just talking about, man, what about this? What did, did you see that? And, and it's, so it's, we're always learning and we're trying to get information from each other. But the beautiful thing for us is we might have a conversation on a Thursday. We both go home. He goes to Cartersville, I go to Birmingham. I'm teaching members all day Saturday, a lot of Sunday. I get to go try and work on the, some of the stuff that we've talked about. And so Pete Cowan's a really good friend of mine. Pete's the same way. He said, well, I'll get an idea. Mike Walker, who is his protege, they work together. <coughs> We'll try something, then we'll go throw it on track, man, and see if it works, or we'll play with it on video. So the benefit of your members is that they're a great litmus test for you, and they're a great resource. Because at the end of the day, most of them are trying to get better. Even if you're not giving them the best information, what you're giving them is probably a lot better than what they're already doing. And so I think it's, a, to me, a teaching authentically at home, and Latour is a great asset. Not all of our peers do it. Plenty of our friends, they don't do that. And I think to us, it's a really good advantage. So here's some of Scott's players. He's got a lot more players than I do, probably because he's a little bit more politically correct than I am. We'll get into that later too. So, All right, so th this is just three examples. And the thing about, you always hear the method, not method and all that. Really, if you teach a lot of guys on the PJ Tour, you can't really be a method guy because they all do different things. And that all works. Like, And every time that you hear something like, this is it. Well, you'll go down the range at a tour, man. There's five guys that do something completely opposite that win millions of dollars every year. So uh, I got Kirky here who, you know, he's kind of one of the unique guys. He hits push draws. He jumps into extension. His leg action's kind of slow. Uh, he rides out, sets way in behind it. And when we get into the pressure mat stuff, he does really different stuff than what a lot of my other guys do whenever we get some of the swing cat info we're going to have up in a little bit. I started teaching Matt Every. I taught him before one time, and then he fired me, which is common on the PGA Tour, man. We, they come and go. It's kind of like bad dating out there. <laughs> so I taught Matt I 13 or 14. He, you know, he struggled at the beginning of the year. I helped him the second half of the year. He kicked butt, played good. Then in December, he fired me. I'm like, all right. So then I had lunch. You know, I had. Uh, dinner with him in Maui after he fired me that, that next year. We got along great, and then he called me back when he struggled. He missed like 15 cuts in a row. But with Matt, <laughs> he just, he's like a, he's, he's a wiry. Now, this is one wiry cat right here. Like, he's got a lot of going on in his head, and he runs hot all the time. But he's kind of has a unique golf swing where he jumps out of the ground. Well, he just got jumping out of the ground too soon. And, you know, his plane kind of got off. His backswing plane, he just got shooting out of the ground too soon. So as simple as, like, for me, what I did is I just got some – I went over to Justin Thomas's caddy, Jimmy Johnson, and got some videos and looked at it. I go, these guys have similar traits. Like, what's his legs doing down through the strike? So right about touch, and I just watched that. I showed it to Matt. We started working on that and getting him on the ground, and he, you know, he made a bunch of cuts in the, the year, and he's playing really nice now. And then I got Trey Mullinax here. He's just – this is – this is what, what's funny is when I was on the range the other day, I was out on, on a group with a group of guys, and they're all young guys, and uh, it was like Tony Finau, uh, Trey, and Hudson. 
And I'm like, oh my God, like these guys are monsters. This is really what the game's evolving to. Would you, wouldn't you agree with that? Yep. I mean, and the thing about these big guys like Trey, his, his, he was hitting three woods the other day, and he was, his club had speed with a three wood was 20, 120 and 119. I mean, so what happens with these big guys if they're efficient drivers? Because driving is the number one thing on the PGA Tour. You've got to drive your golf ball. If you, you can, you can drive, if you drive it good and drive it long, you can be kind of mediocre at everything else. And what happens with these big guys now is they can hang in there long enough to learn the other skill sets. They're not going to lose their car. They can ride it out long enough to learn how to chip, to learn how to putt, course management, how to play. But somebody that's a 110 guy, he's got to be really great at everything right when he shows up just to keep his tour card, especially when you're playing out of that web qualification zone. So, but these are, you know, these are three really different swingers of the club. I got Kirky, Kirky there that kind of hits push, draw, flips. Matt shoots out of the ground. And Trey, like, rides his right heel out and, you know, gets it across, has a real late across the line. So, as you can see, I'm working on different guys. Well, I learned how to work on all these different guys while working on those, I mean, hackers in my club that are shooting it everywhere, hitting the side of my bay when they're hitting that. <laughs> so, you mean people like this? Yeah. So, these are some of my Moppy crew. All right. So, I think one thing that, that to really important to touch on here that, that Scott just mentioned is those three players, they're all different, but these are players that we inherit. So, tour teaching is a lot of the times... Someone will try something, and most players, not all, but a lot of them, they are quick fix creatures. So if somebody's having some success with somebody and it's a buddy of theirs, they're gonna try it. And so we inherit a lot of bad tendencies and bad concepts. And that's one of the things that I think you've done a great job with when you first got Kirk. How far out inside out was Kirky when you hey, first it was had two him? down and 13 in the out. So, and Kirk's friends with a couple of players I've got, and I mean, Kirk goes, well, I didn't draw that much, did it? And he'll start one down the right rough line at Bay Hill, and it might finish in the left rough. <laughs> Unbelievable. So, he, Scott's done a great job, but it's one of the things is, the lessons we learn from these other players is that you're not getting the stereotypical player. Not everyone's like Trey Mullinex that mashes it. We, the, the players that really need help a lot of times are the guys with the idiosyncrasies, and we're inheriting bad habits. So, just like these players. So, we have... This guy comes all the way from Georgia to see me. Obviously, you messed him up, so that's why he comes to see me now. <laughs> or maybe you're just too busy with all these players you've got. But. So the real world of helping players like this, like they want to get better, but how do, how do you, you, what are the lessons you give them? And it, it's the same thing. It's what do they want the ball to do? So my, my first question to everybody is like, what shot do you want to hit? You've got to start with the out, end in mind or the outcome and then work backwards. And I think with the poor player, You've got to make a change. You've got to be able to have an impact on them. And so using them is really, really useful. Golf clubs are the same. The golf ball's the same. It doesn't matter who you are. Where the ball position is, is going to relatively affect what they're doing, where their posture, where their alignment. And so these things are really important. Some of the lessons you've got on the tour, how do you relate that back to the leadership staff and our fellow professionals, Scott and I are PGA members, that we're actually teaching and we're doing things every day. Because what we do is no different. It's just that the people that we teach don't have their names on their bags. So, at our clubs. So, why don't we uh, talk a little bit about, we wanted to take some key areas that we think are gonna be really useful for you guys to go to your lesson tea tomorrow. When I go to a seminar and I go to lots of them and teach a lot, I wanna be able to take the information, go and apply it tomorrow. And I think that some of the practices we both have, if you look statistically, all of our players are pretty good ball strikers. So we both look for people that uh, can putt really good that can't hit it very good. Wouldn't you agree with that? Oh, uh, yeah. That's our like, yeah. money ticket. If the person can putt it pretty good, we like to go up the, high up in the putting ranks and way down in the greens and regulation and driving stats. Those are the people that well, we can actually help them. They're pretty good. If they can hit it really good in putting, that may not necessarily be our forte, right? Would we agree with that? Yeah, but I mean, I get these guys all the time where I'm looking at them like, I started teaching Aaron Badley, he was number one in strokes game and last in driving. I'm like, this is going to be like cheating. First holy plays when I started teaching, down the middle on the green, three putt, 22 feet. I'm like, what? Like, man, that's not what I signed up for. That's not my area. <laughs> so they'll trick me in a heartbeat. Absolutely. Like, I love to have, when you look and their putting's great and they're driving bad, that's the ticket right there. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's kind of get on a little bit. Why don't you uh, 
touch on this. Yeah, I, so, you know, as, as when I first got on tour, I was like everybody else. I'd stand out there and, you know, I'd stand with Boo or one of these guys and they'd hit millions of six irons, they'd hit one offline and they'd be pissed. And, you know, we spent all our time just pounding straight that are worthless. So as time's gone on, I mean, how many people have a track man? Getting around 40, 50%. So obviously we got we have track man and, and lucky to have it. But the thing that I do every week with my guys, which I've got great results out of this, is I kind of made a track man test where the tour guys play off speed. So I started this on really with Scott Stallings just because I'd go watch him play, he'd hit it down the middle, he'd get like an 80 yard shot and hit 35 feet and then wonder at the end why he three putted. I'm like, dude, cause you're hitting like 35 feet. So I got a, tr I got a little track man test I just made it myself where we hit, uh, I hit, first thing I do is I have the guy stand up there and hit 50, 60, 70, 80 yard shots. And, I, and the thing about good players is after they hit enough of them, they can tell you when the ball's in the air how far it's going. If they don't practice it, they can't. But if they stand out there, then bam, the next thing, oh, that's about 52. Well, I mean, fast they go from, from can't do that at all to it's unbelievable how accurate these guys are. So then I, do, I run a test where I have them hit seven balls and it's a game. It's 50, 55, 60, 65. And I add up the difference on every shot for the seven shots, and I have a score. A good score for a tour guy is 12. So, you know, like I've had as low as one guy did uh, 6.8. But the average is like 12 to 15. And the other thing that I do on that is I put that side number up, and they have to be within 10 feet. So they have to be within, like, there and anything with that outside there, then I penalize them additionally, like add two yards to it. So add two more to the score. So that, doing that, really worked well for my tour guys and they liked it, it was a challenge. A, it took up time on the range where we just weren't pounding six irons. The thing about it is I took that back to my club and I started, and I teach quite a few college D1 girls because I like them, they listen and they're fun. Unlike the boys that just want to hit it over the back of the range. So do your golf holes. Yeah. So I I I started doing this with my college kids, and it was amazing. Like, and even with tour guys, the first time they do it, if they score anything below twenty, I'm shocked. So like the college girls would score like thirty five on it, but literally if I just kept doing it with them, then the next thing they're scoring you know fifteen, sixteen, and and that directly related to them playing better golf. And the other thing was the ball goes where the face points. So they're working on pointing the face in the right direction. So that's one of the things that, that I do that I burn a lot of time doing. With. And actually, I think I'm really helping people score better. Oh, 100%. I mean, let's, let's look at a few, few swings here. So you've got Hudson here. I think one of the things with a wedge, too, is they're going to have the way the game is now, particularly people that are powerful and dynamic, they're going to have a lot of wedge shots. And so. They need to know how to regulate that distance. And we'll get into a little bit of some of the things that we both agree good wedge players do. The great thing about when you slow the swing down, it gives them better awareness of what they're doing. And to Scott's point, their face control has to be way better because that's largely responsible where that ball's going to start. They become more aware of it. They're swinging slower. They're in rhythm. Their contact becomes better. So their overall management of what they're doing becomes a lot more consistent. And at the end of the day, on the PGA Tour, we're looking for consistency. They come and they're trying to play 18, 36, 54, 72 holes from a three, four week stretch. We're more interested in the cumulative average of what they're doing. To Scott's point on the siding, he doesn't want it outside 10 feet. If you can, over the course of a tournament, know that your average is around 10 feet, well, your proximity is off the charts good. So if you practice in a threshold that's harder than you're going to perform in, it makes life a lot easier. So. Let's take a look at Hudson here. So Hudson slings it back there and then he kind of gets it laid off and swipes it. And I mean, for a guy that hits it a mile, he can only hit a lob wedge like 90 yards, you know? But that's what it is. He drives the eyes out of it. So I'm not gonna go change that a bunch and give him a bunch of forward lean and shut the face down a bunch where I jack the rest of his swing up. So the best thing I, with HUD, like what we'll do is we'll monkey with his ball position, try to get his compression up a little bit, try to get the ball out of the air. But I'm not trying to change his wedge swing and screw up his driver swing, and I've done it, trust me. 
Like you gotta, I always teach to their strengths, not to their weaknesses. So, and then Boo, this is, I mean, Boo's a whole different, oof, I don't even know where to go with that. Boo was chipping, well, this might be the only recorded chip shot I've ever had of Boo because he doesn't chip. <laughs> like, <laughs> I asked him one time, we're going to the, the, I said, should we hit some chips, Boo? And he goes, nah, man, I'm not planning on missing any greens today, bud. I'm like, all right. <laughs> and then, like, D-Rob, his caddy last year, it said, hey, we were at Tampa. He goes, let's just hit three or four chips when we go to the, tea, to the tee. And Boo's like, all right. Hits him like three chips, goes out like Skull's the first one. He looks at D-Rob, he goes, you screwed my chipping up with that practice, man. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, mean, I, I think that you bring up, I bring up a really good point, is on like tendencies. So, so we're always, we're at an age in a world of like what's optimum. Well, you need to go with what's the strength of somebody. So if we look at wedges, there's, there's some really good research. Anyone familiar with Rob Neal and Lane Savoy? So Lane's not in here, is he? Um, so they've done some really cool research with a lot of really good wedge players. And so, to the point of Hudson, the better wedge players, and I'm going to show you a video of Chappie here, face on, better wedge players, there's, there's certain things they're really good at. They're really good at regulating the angle of attack, they're really good at being pretty centered, and to Scott's point, they regulate their speed with their torso rotation. A couple of things that they don't do. Good wedge players don't have a lot of lead leg slide. Okay, now, if you know Hudson's golf swing and some other good players, Chappie the same, they drive the lights out of it and they mash it. They're great mid-iron players and they drive it great. They might struggle with wedges. Chappie might move off the ball a bit. The problem is, I'm always trying to improve that area of the game, but I don't want it to be at the detriment of the other side of the game. So you have to understand that different shots require different variables. And back to Scott's point, we're in an age where if you can drive the ball a long way and you can hit it pretty straight, that makes up for a lot because par fives become very reachable. The long par fours aren't long par fours, they're just normal holes and they've got short to mid irons into them. So when, when we're looking at this and we're working at it, we're always working within the framework of what we want to do. Now, I think when we, we talk about our regular members, which we're gonna kind of, this is kind of more where we're at, I think the thing for them is they're going to have so many shots inside 140 yards that they need to become very proficient with the shorter clubs and a wedge. And I don't necessarily think, and we'll see what Scott says, but we kind of agree that giving them a technique that's going to favor those shots is, is a good thing for them, oh, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So it's one of those things where make sure that they have a ball position in a position that allows them to hit a pretty neutral neutral shot, might move it back a little bit, you might change the setup a little bit, you might get them a little more tilted. Things that you may not do with a good, a really good player, but with a club golfer, most of them, where do most club golfers attack the ball from? Which direction, are they coming outside in or inside out? Outside in. Outside in, right? So you move the ball up, get the club shallow, I guess where are they gonna start the ball and where it's going left, right? So again, manipulate their setup, some of those things to help them, get them to where they understand they can be a little more rotary and try and control the speed with their body. I think those things are important. Now, they're not always going to be able to accomplish it, but if you give them a, a goal, that becomes important. But the most important thing about it, and if you don't have access to a track man, we have a couple of suggestions coming up, but is you've got to practice the right trajectory, the shape and gapping, right? I mean, that's the, right, yeah. the, you've, you've got to make sure that you have the ability to encourage your members to practice it. So not everybody uh, has access to a track man. We, we had about 50% here. So we're from the South and we like to redneck engineer a lot of stuff. And so if, if you can't necessarily afford a track man, there is a very high tech purchase you can make and that is like soccer cones. So my kids play soccer, lacrosse, these are lying all over our house. We use those with our juniors or you can go buy a set of cones from Dick's or Sports Authority. Those, those things, putting those out in 10 yard increments, five yard increments, just getting somebody to aim at something consistently and making them realize or conceptualize they're gonna have so many of those shots. If they want their handicap to improve, short game chipping and pitching for your average member is the best way to, is that's the, the place to focus there and the driver, and we'll, we'll get to the driver a little bit, but set them up with that, put them through that. Most of the time they don't like it, it's very, Initially, they get frustrated. 
but their awareness will improve and they will get better. So it, it, that's one of the things. And our tour players, to Scott's point, they want to mash the longer clubs. They want to do what they're really good at. Everybody practices their strengths. The reality is you want to improve your weaknesses. And if you want to take your handicap from 14 to 10, it's probably not going to be on your ability to hit seven irons and mid irons better. It's going to be to turn a six into a five or a five into a four. Yeah, no doubt.